my fellow dream chasers and Disney fans across the world, and welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney, or in today's case, the darkness of Disney. Yes, because we are yes. going through what many people believe to be the darkest Disney film that has ever been made on the animation front, especially. We are, of course, talking about a cult classic for many a Disney fan, The Black Cauldron, released in 1985, based on the book series The Chronicles of Pridian, by, uh, written by Lloyd Alexander. But of course, it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without having a guest on board with me. It is uh, it's his third appearance on the show, and it is the first in a back-to-back -back appearance for him because he will also be with me for the next episode involving Basil the Great Mouth Detective. It's Alan Sunter. Alan, welcome back. Hi, uh, glad to be back. Yeah, so yeah, The Black Cauldron, first animated Disney film to get a PG rating. And it uh, and with some of the behind the scenes stuff that I that I found when researching this, it it was actually very close to getting a PG-13 rating yep. which is the equivalent uh, of a 12 over here in the uk yep that doesn't surprise me from the stuff i've heard about the making of it as well <laughs> and certain um certain scenes which have been uh released over time but uh <laughs> yeah so uh not very no, often this, I... this could be the closest disney has come really to doing a horror movie in a lot of ways effectively yes and that's without going to their subsidiaries like touchstone or Hollywood Pictures or of other studios that they they uh, they have under they had have or had under them, uh -huh. but um, but yeah, uh, I mean Jeffrey Katzenberg being one of the people that was part of the process of making this film. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll get, we'll get we might, it. Might have to tone this down just a little bit, guys. Even if it means having to edit the film himself, which uh, didn't quite go to plan. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, like I say, um, listen, this is based on the this is based on the Chronicles of Pridian. It's based on two of the five books in the series, The Book of Three, and of course, the title of the film, The Black Cauldron, written by Lloyd Alexander. Uh, so yeah, I. So yeah, like I say, um, not very often I do this sort of thing, but um, on top of the usual spoiler alert, I'm also going to put viewer discretion at the bottom as well, because uh, some of the clips in this film, yeah, if you've got any children watching, um, proceed mm -hmm. at your, proceed with caution, because some of it yeah. gets... Because uh, some of the details with this film uh, are pretty dark, and in some cases, pretty scary, and that, and uh, and that's even without the clips taken into account. <laughs> so here we go. Let's go through. Let's go through. Uh, let's go through the Black Cauldron. So we have the narration. Uh, we have the. We Which have is so eerie. Such an eerie opening narration. Yeah, and the visuals for for this as well. I, I think it it already right out the gate. You already have this unnerving feeling that this is not your classic Disney film, happy go lucky yeah. fairy tale ending. E no, this this is the... prop, this is proper dark fantasy territory. Yeah, everything from the really chilling eerie music to the haunting narration to just that kind of terrifying image of the black cauldron itself and that evil face just looking almost at you it's oh horrible yeah but it, but, it, but in a good way <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, and as you can see folks he's got he's got a little small like black cauldron mug if you yeah, nowhere near as scary as the one in the movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say, third time he's done something like this for for, for these episodes. Yeah, that, uh, that seems to be a thing I'm now challenging myself on. How can I make? <laughs> yeah, how how can his uh, tea tie in with the episodes that we're doing? 
Yeah. So, so yeah, no pre- So yeah, no pressure, folks, regarding uh, Basil the Great Mouse Detective, because Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> he had his he had his Mad Hatter mug. Uh, many <laughs> Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, he had Earl Grey with some honey mixed into it, and now mm-hmm. he's got a and now he's got a cauldron for his mug yeah, today. I'll, I'll need I'll need to think of something for uh, Basil. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, let's uh, see. The narration here is done by John Houston. Uh, and then what, once that narration's out of the way, you just so you get this huge bombastic swell from the orchestra with the title card, and then you get the first scene, uh, and then you get like the, the first proper scene of the film, which is there we go. Hey. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that's... right off the bat, that's that's one of the best things about this movie: the music. It has got yes. an incredible score. Yeah. Uh, which I've also, which uh, I have touched on uh, here in my notes. I see the, the music right out the gate from that, from uh, they taking narration, taking the narration out of the equation, but just that opening shot with the background behind me. It does have that Lord of the Rings vibe to it, if you will. Yeah. I see, I see, just, you're just, just listening to that flute or, or, so, or like uh, with that, with the wind instruments in the background as as we're um as we're starting to see more of this world that we're going to be exploring throughout the next uh, yeah the, the world of Pr- so. Prudane itself yes and then we have um we've got uh Dolben, uh who is the first like proper character we're uh, introduced to uh Fred- freddie jones he is uh voiced by um, Freddie Jones was also uh, the showman called Bites in The Elephant Man, which was in 1980, about five years before this film yeah. was released. And he also was... with John Hurt, funnily enough. Yes. And he was also Sandy Thomas for our friends, for our UK uh, viewers over here. He was Sandy Thomas for 13 years on the ITV soap opera Emmerdale from 2005. He was also one of... Through to 2018. Yeah, he was also one of the most um, tragic Frankenstein monsters in Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed. Oh, that which, which is which is another very intense movie. <laughs> yeah, you, you do you do tend to find that with most of those classic horror films, especially of that era. Mm. But yeah. Um, uh, we get introduced to him. He, he, he's, he's talking about the horned king, black hearted devil, his exact words. <laughs> and and he's uh, and he's uh, he's sort of sort of like this uh, overprotective parental figure, if you will, for uh, Tyrant, who is voiced by Grant uh, uh, Bardsley. And I can't seem to find anything on him beyond the fact that he was in this film. Not really much I, not really much I can do about that at this point. But, um, um, but Taran is a, an assistant pig keeper and the, and the pig he's looking after is of course, uh, Henwin with, with oracular powers or, is it, um, which which it says here, uh, an oracle is a person or agency considered to provide wise and insightful counsel or prophetic predictions, most notably including precognition of the future, inspired by deities. As as such, it is a form of di- uh, divination. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Henwin's effectively an oracle uh, in this film, and seeing. Seeing those um, oracle powers in play when we when we see like the visuals in that in that little bowl dish whatever of um, the horned king where the black cauldron is and then and then you see and then the last image we see in that particular shot there is you see Henwin running and it's a, and that tells you that yes the horned king knows about Henwin's powers and 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 Dolben has to stop uh, has to stop uh, Henwin using her powers to like effectively 
bring her back to reality. It was just, whoa. It uh, brings a whole new meaning to a wake-up call. <laughs> yeah. But... Um... And, and right off the bat, like, um, they're doing a great job of setting up the main antagonist. The way they all talk about him with, like, almost a, you know kind of fearful hushed ways like you you know before you've even met him that this is a guy to take seriously yeah absolutely because the, the way i say like, th this is one of the this is one of the things i really like about this film it's the fact that that they're giving you the details about the horned king without actually bringing him on screen first yeah, yeah. and and with the way they're doing it with um the I guess basin of water or whatever that Hen Wen puts her nose into. Like you do get the feeling that there is a lore to all of this. You know, there is a whole other story that <laughs> could be told, you know? Cause I, yeah. cause doesn't um, Taran refer to wanting to um, join in the wars or something. So you think, Oh, right. So yeah. This yeah. Is he a, wants to be a warrior. Yeah. This is a land that is used to conflict to the point where, you know, it's almost glorified. Yeah, and then and then Dolbin uh, effectively packs some supplies for uh, Tarrant to uh, to go on this journey to find to to effectively find this black cauldron to try and uh, to try and work out how to a stop the Horn King from using its powers and b try and work out how to effectively destroy it, but. Uh, uh, as we're going to find out soon, the Black Cauldron isn't able to be destroyed somewhat. Mm. But um, but while they're on the but while they're on the way um, while they're on the way to uh, find find this cauldron, um, Taran ends up having this like sort of like vision in in this this little um, this pond stream whatever it is. Yeah, um, he's basically daydreaming. Yeah. Daydreaming that he has become a warrior and is uh, and has become the true hero of uh, Prydain. And while he's having this daydream, Henwin's run off. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's like started his journey and already he's getting distracted. <laughs> yeah. But of course, that's somewhat to be expected from like protagonists of... Uh, like, any anything fantasy related? I mean, yeah. I mean, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say a couple of examples right out the gate. I'll say, you, I'll say you've got, you've got uh, Frodo from the Lord. Of, you've got, you've got Frodo from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I mean, I mean you've, and then you, you've got, you've got his friend uh, Sam, Sam, and all that. But uh, mm -hmm. I'll say, I'll say that, that's just a, that's just a couple of examples right out the gate of mm -hmm. uh, like um, the. The fantasy hero being distracted right out the gate before the quest has even properly begun, and yeah, then once the stakes, he re are, the stakes haven't been raised just yet. Yes, but uh, uh, we don't have to wait too much longer for that to actually happen. But before we get into that, we oh boy, this is this next character. Oh boy, I was um, I was dreading. I say. Like, I was actually watching it earlier this week for, for recording this episode. <sighs> ah! Oh, Ooh, great prince. Get poor starving Gurgi munchings and crunchies. Nice apple. Um, Gurgi <laughs> ends up... I... We, we get introduced to Gurgi. Gurgi ends up uh, taking an, the apple from uh, Taran's supplies and... Growing up, I never realized how annoying Gurgi sounds. <laughs> effectively, he's effectively Jar Jar, Jar, Binks, Jar Binks of his day. before Jar Jar Binks was a thing. <laughs> uh, I was watching um, an interview with the guy who voiced Gurgi, John uh, Biner, I believe his name is, and he said that um, because he thought Gurgi would be such a fun character to play, he would add a uh, a child's inflection to what he had to say, which apparently results in, in this, like basically proto-stitch, except with an added layer of uh, 
Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very questionable if you ask me. That wasn't supposed he's, to happen. He's not. He's not. He's not the most annoying character you'll ever encounter in the movie, but uh, he does kind of overstay his welcome. Yeah, but. Um... But that again, you, there are some films which just feel the need for a comedy relief, especially in, you know, such an intense story. So I. Yeah. I get it, but still, there. Yeah. Yeah, is he? He's definitely, he's definitely not one of my favorite comic relief characters. And, and, and it's ma it's mainly just because it's mainly just because of the the presentation of, um, mainly the presentation of his voice, though. But I will say this: massive thumbs up to uh, John Biner for for doing doing his best with uh, uh, with uh, what he what he was given. Yeah. Um. Uh. Takes a little bit of persuasion, but Gurgi does end up telling Taran where Henwin has gone, and then you just you just hear this you just hear this constant squealing from Henwin, and this is the point where the stakes get raised already. And my <laughs> goodness me, this is just the start of the nightmare fuel, folks. Because, but I will say the. I will say this: as far as the character design is concerned, especially for those, especially for those dragon-like creatures, just horns all over, those are horns all over their, um, uh, horns all over their body. You see, you see, you see the jagged edges on the wings, and you can actually see how sharp their claws or talons are. Oh, it's, yeah, it's it's and, talons and, and for owls. It's talons for owls. Yeah, and and the the screeching noise they make is is genuinely pretty <laughs> scary. Yeah, like it, it sounds like I don't know something about it just gets under your skin the way they sound the the guithaints. Yeah, and the music at and the music at this point I see it's already it's already on an intense level at the at this point. I see they are I see, they were not afraid to make the music as intense. As it was, let's say the music. While I'm on the <laughs> subject, Irma, by Elmer Bernstein, I believe. Yes, he has. He has got a very extensive resume. Where do we even begin? He huh. did. Um, I say, I say, this is just some of the works that he's done. He's done something in the region of over a hundred and fifty original movie scores over the course of his lifetime. These include The Ten Commandments, The Magnificent Seven, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Great Escape, The Rookies, Animal House, Airplane, Heavy Metal, Ghostbusters, 1984, Cape Fear, Age of Innocence, Wild Wild West, and Far From Heaven. And early in his career, he also scored a camp classic called Robot Monster. Even won an Oscar for Thoroughly Modern Millie back in 1967. Nominated for 14 Oscars, winning two Golden Globes and Emmy, and was also nominated for two Grammys and two Tonys. So, yeah, that's a pretty extensive resume, if you ask me. Oh, yeah. Have, uh, as, as a side note, have you ever seen um, Robot Monster? Uh, not. It's not one that's it's, come up on my radar until, uh, it's, until doing the research here. It's very, very silly. Even down to the design of the monster, it's literally just a gorilla suit with a silver diving helmet and two antennae sticking out of it. Oh my word! Uh, yeah, I've I've just had a look at the poster. <laughs> <laughs> I've just had a look, but, but of course, he's, he's at always, the time, he, at the time, he's talking, you do expect. Sorry, sorry. At the, at the time, so, oh, the monster's sorry, always sorry. talking about trying to understand the human. I must study the human. <laughs> Good grief. Yeah. But so like I said, I've just seen a look at the post. I've just had a look at the poster. And yeah, that, yeah, it, it, do it does look rather ridiculous. <laughs> but, uh, but 1953, uh, so I've just seen the budget for the film. $16,000 for the budget for the film. $16,000. <sighs> and it managed to make a, it managed to make a million dollars at the box office. <laughs> So they must have done something, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure it was entertaining, but for none of the reasons that they anticipated. Yeah, 
But, uh, <laughs> oh boy. But yeah. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Yes. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> um, but of course, in bet- but of course, before all of that, we also we we get a scene where we actually see the Haunt King on screen for the first time, voiced yes. brilliantly by the late John Hurt. Oh um, yeah, one of his best performances ever. Oh, I, without I, a I love doubt. I love the way he described the voice for the the Haunt King. He described it as something dredged from the bowels of the earth. Yeah. And you can really hear it with the way he delivers his lines. Very much dredged from somewhere. Yeah. It was like, it was like everything from everything from the the lighting for that scene, the voice and yeah. the music. It, unsettling, intimidating, but overall yep. brilliant. In my opinion, the two scariest um, Disney villains ever are, just for how much menace there is in his brief appearance, Chernobog from Fantasia. Since, yep. let's, let's be fair, it's the devil. You, you know, <laughs> you don't get much scarier than the devil. Of course not. And, and, and the Horned King. Just, he's... Everything about him, from his absolutely, like, horrifying, like, leech, li- lich design, the voice the music around him and the fact that whenever he appears later on and there's people in the room he literally just has to enter a room and everyone just like goes silent and scared that's a mark of a powerful villain that he just has to go into a room and everyone's terrified of him and yeah he's, and he's one of my favorite villains of all time because of it yeah actually um, a bit of research into it he's actually a combination of uh two villains from the original source material Mm -hmm. he's mostly inspired by the main villain from i think uh the first book uh, aaron death lord and his right hand man the horned king who is basically he's essentially like um if aaron was darth sidious then the horned king was darth maul essentially Mm, um and so the horn king is a, so the horn king is a combination of the two they were originally thinking of making the villain be aaron himself but they thought well the horn king has horns so that'll be a better design <laughs> yeah they they basically thought well it, it, it worked with maleficent yep and of course maleficent is one of the most most iconic disney villains of all time which exactly. which which can hear which can hear my thoughts on with my guest at the time uh in uh, in that episode alongside the rest of our kingdom of isolation episodes in the playlist in the top right of your screen and don't worry folks we are going to get to that entrance that alan mentioned shortly we are going to get to that entrance shortly although there is actually what might be a reference to um aaron in the film because remember that narration at the beginning talking about how there was a king so evil and so cruel that even the gods even the feared gods him. feared him maybe that's maybe that's who they were referencing yeah i th- i think that could be and certainly um fans of the book have theorized that that could be and if so then well played i do love when Disney st- Disney fans theorize over these sort of things. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, the um, let's see that. But that whole scene where you see the the dragon like creatures, with like the sharp claws, talons, whatever you want to call them, the horns, yes. the, the screeching, and just you, you can you can even see how sharp the teeth are. And wow, it is a very intense scene and you actually see blood coming out of Taran's mouth and it's yeah. one of the it's one of those very very rare instances where you actually see blood in a disney film yeah oh i was just thinking back to that um scene with uh, the horn king by the way and i've just remembered one line which i just think is so cool might be one of my favorite villain lines <laughs> ever oh my soldiers how long I have thirsted to be a god among mortal men. 
It kind of it reminds me of when um, John Hurt played Caligula on the excellent I Claudius, which is another one of his great great performances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and th- and that just shows. As it I say, what one thing I did notice in the cast is that mm-hmm. it is a predominantly British cast. Yeah. I mean, I mean, gr- yeah. I mean, granted, the source material is based effectively on Welsh mythology. Yes, but the casting directors felt that having a primarily English cast would give the film a more um, classic feel to a classical feel to it, rather. Yeah, which make which makes sense considering mm-hmm. you know the Welsh mythology and the fantasy aspect and all that. Yeah, it's it's absolutely, but like, but that scene. Um, Tarin can't catch up to the. Uh, I'm, I'm, j- I'm just going to call them dragons just to make it a little easier for myself. Uh, I, I think they're called the Gwithaints. Gwithaints, that's the ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Gwithaints. Uh, he doesn't catch the Gwithaints, but he does see the Horned King's castle. And he's thinking to himself, yeah, I need, I, I need to go there to get Henwin back. And. Uh, and then we and then we see and then we see Gergi. He's just like, um, yeah, me go in there. Oh no, no, that, it's a terrible place. <laughs> yeah, but um, that's it. And then Tarin's just like, yeah, here, take the rest of this apple and get and, out of here. Yeah, uh, but yeah, and that's and that's the last we see of Gergi for now, because yes. because because the next because the next like third of the film. Also, a third of the film or so is set predominantly in the Horned King's castle, and whew, yeah, so you've got you've got his like you've got his henchmen uh, at this like uh, this tavern in whatever in in this castle, and then you just see the light you you see the wind bl- you see and hear the wind blowing the lights go out, and then we get to that entrance. Oh my word. Yeah, and, and the music is swelling and swelling until it bursts. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, yeah. and you just see his, his silhouette with like lightning around it until finally you see the actual form of him. And oh my God. Is what you call an entrance? Hell yeah! I mean, I mean, th- I have legitimately no words to describe how amazing that entrance is. Just the music, <laughs> the visuals, and I say, just effectively surrounded by smoke, and everyone is just in fear of this guy. That is how it's how I want to make an entrance whenever I go to a manager's meeting at work. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. But um let's see, we, we also get introduced to Creeper, who is voiced by Phil Fondacaro, however you pronounce that. If I pronounced it wrong, let me know in the comments. Yeah. Um he has done some other he has done some other fantasy films as well. He did the original troll film not the infamous troll two with the oh my god the original <laughs> troll film from 1986 uh willow in 1988 uh. and he was also a recurring he also had a recurring role of roland in the sabrina the teenage witch series hmm. now whether that was the live action version no yeah it was the live action version with melissa joan hart as Sabrina herself. So definitely has a lot of uh, definitely has a lot of fantasy in his uh, in his resume, folks. <laughs> but yeah, you uh, see, you see, uh, Creeper is not as annoying as Gergi, but uh, he does have that. Um, 
he does have that hint of insanity in his voice. Yeah, like he's he he, he, he he's 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 creepy, like in his name. But yeah. uh, he's 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 not um not like uh, the typical bumbling henchman of the bad guy. But it's like it's clear he thinks himself to be more important than he actually is, you know. And he doesn't like um goof up as much again as like your typical bumbling um uh sidekick to the bad guy but he does um like he does get a lot of the blame for from the horn king oh yes uh, I'm, I'm starting to think the horn king is just a bad boss sounds about sounds about right yeah All, always <laughs> always blaming somebody else for uh for for what goes wrong rather than taking responsibility for his uh for his own actions uh, i say i say just this is just the way he just literally effectively tries to squeeze creeper's head off his shoulders uh you don't think that's the prototype to uh homer strangling bart and the simpsons by any chance do you <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. The granted, I mean, granted, the Horn King doesn't need two hands; he just needs one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I definitely wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of. Um, I wouldn't want. To, definitely wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of uh, the Horn King's tracks <laughs> if he's having a bad day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, you see, there's there's a, there's a little exchange between. Um, uh, between everybody involved in the Horns King, but uh, Taran, um, I was like, well, uh, pff, he's, he's been it? watching um, these proceedings from like uh, the rafters, from the rafters, but, yes, but ends up accidentally falling into the, the meeting, yes, it's uh, and he's was like, he, he, he's, he's just happy to be reunited with uh. Uh, with Henwin, uh, but uh, effectively, but he he refuses to tell the Horned King where the Black Cauldron is because he's not going to be yeah. showcasing Henwin's powers. Yeah. Uh, and, and I love the Horned King's response to that because all the time he's been, you know, uh, uh, holding a goblet of wine in his hand, and then when when Tyron says, you know, I I I, I promised I, I wouldn't tell anybody the secret, and the Horned King says. Very well. In that case, the pig is no use to me. And then and just crushes the goblet. Oh my word! How much power is within this this basically skeleton with skin on? Over nine thousand. Oh, not now, Vegeta. <laughs> Didn't think I'd be using drag. Didn't think I'd be interrupted by Dragon Ball of all things in the Kingdom of Isolation. But it hey, happens. For- First time for everything, folks. I got interrupted <laughs> by, I got interrupted by Timmy Flippin Turner from the Fairly Odd Parents when we did the when he did when he did when we did Winnie the Pooh, and and that was mainly because of the fact that I mentioned one of the uh, voice actors was Timothy Turner, and then at that point, mm, yeah, the Fairly Odd Parents theme started playing. Don't get me wrong, the Fairly Odd Parents theme is very catchy, but come on, you can't interrupt me like that. Time and place, exactly. But yeah, I'll say just I'll say just the power. The Horn King has without having to raise his voice. Yeah. How is that even possible? It's, if anything, that makes him even more intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing. He's so, you know, for the most part, calm and collected. You know, like he, he's in, he knows he's in total power, basically. Yep. Nobody can, nobody can stand up to him effectively. Yeah. And, and so because he says, oh, the pig is no use to me, they bring out a chopping block for her. <laughs> yeah, and then and then again, you have the music swelling, and then Tyron effectively concedes and says, right, okay, I'll show you the powers. I'll, sh- I'll, t- I'll get her to tell you where it is. Yeah. And, and the Horn King just simply says, that's better. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and uh, and that uh, yes, the Black Cauldron does indeed exist, and uh, yeah, oh boy, we, um, we get one of the most terrifying shots in the whole movie when they're they're seeing the vision in the water tub, and like the Horn King is just like creeping up behind Tar and looking in the water, saying, "Now, 
Where is it? Show me. And uh, like you, you get this like zoom into his like red glowing eyes. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that, is, that is terrifying. Yeah. And then, and then you, and then you have this, and then you get this chase sequence playing out where, um, where Torrance is trying to escape the henchmen. Um, and, and yes, folks, the henchmen do have voice actors to their name. Uh, they've got uh, Peter Re- Renaday, Wayne Allwine, James Almanzar, Steve Hale, Phil Nibble, Phil Nibblink, and Jack Lang. I think I also read somewhere that uh, Tony J had an uncredited role as one of the henchmen, but I've no idea if that's true or not. Tony J, George Claude Frollo from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yeah. That, wow. Yeah, he's had, um, before he got really uh, big with Hunchback, he did quite a few, um, like, background voices, basically. He, he just hadn't found his niche yet, I guess. Now, let's see. Yes! Yes, he has! He has, in fact. Uh, I'm be- yeah! Tony J was one of the hench... He was huh? one of the henchmen. How's about that? <laughs> yeah. But- big Just goes to show, big things from little acorns grow. Indeed, yeah. Uh, ch- chase, chase ends, and uh, he's cap- He's captured by the Horn King, and he's. But at he's, least Hen- Henwin's now managed to be, like, managed to get her over the ramparts and into the moat. So at least yeah. she's now free. Somewhat, yeah. Yeah. And it also, and it also means at the expense of uh, Taran being thrown into the dungeon. Pleasant. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And he's he's blaming himself. He's like, yes, this is my fault. Where, where did it all go wrong? But uh, yeah, turns out he's not the only one in the dungeon at this point. Because there's two other captives at this point. We've got Princess, excuse me, Princess Alonwi, voiced by Susan Sheridan. Mm. Uh, I, I read that she was originally going to be voiced by... Uh, Haley Mills from the Parent Trap and that darn cat, but ah, for some okay. but for some reason they replaced her, and I've not been able to find a reason why. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe they just thought that her voice didn't have the I don't know whatever quality they were looking for with Ilonwi yeah. or something. It 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 happens sometimes. Like yeah. like you you cast you some people sometimes voice actors get cast for something and they. They do a good job, but then one director or producer says, I don't know, I don't think that's quite what we're looking for, and then they'll end up replaced. It's sad, but it happens. Yeah. So I've, and uh, something, I've just, uh, something I've just discovered as well, uh, regarding uh, Susan Sheridan, she mm-hmm. was... Uh, where the... Where is it? She was also the voice of Noddy in one of the Noddy TV series, uh, specifically <laughs> specifically Noddy's Toyland Adventures. So, and and, and I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure I know which one it, it is. I might hmm. be wrong on that one. I just need to double check. L- look, yeah, it, it, is, it is the one I'm thinking of. It is the one I'm thinking of. The, the one that has the theme that, that goes, Naughty, the little man, yeah, the red, the I yellow. I thought that was the one. Yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, to, I, mean, talk, I mean, talk about a massive departure, being part of a dark <laughs> fantasy film in the Black Cauldron, and then you just have this preschool, and then going all the way to a preschool kids show in the form of Naughty. How's about that? <laughs> Just another fine example of uh, somebody having a very wide range as far yeah. as characters are concerned. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it was a massive contrast of roles, but uh, what else has she done? Uh, she's, she's done a few, she's done a few other um, uh, kids, t- uh, kids stuff as well. She did uh, a little, the little polar bear, 
Oh my, what? Do you, do you remember this one on the CDBC? Albert the Fifth Musketeer. You remember that one? That does ring a bell. Yeah. Um, so she was a character called um, uh, Milady, spelt M I L A D Y. Uh, she was also yeah. she was also in the Animal Shelf, and one of the characters she played was Get Up the Giraffe. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I mean, I mean that that's you. I mean, what a massive. Uh, I think she's she's only got like two. She's only got two film credits to her name officially. Um, uh, the other one she had, she was a wedding official in Eisenstein uh, in the year 2000. You can say she's only got two uh, major film credits to her name, but she was, but- She has she, still found work. Yeah. She was in a TV adaptation of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, though. <laughs> so there's that as well. Uh, the other uh, captive is uh, Fluda Flam, who is a minstrel and is voiced by- Nigel Hawthorne, who and... is one of the greatest British actors of all time. Like th th this movie has two of my favorite actors ever, and it's John Hurt and Nigel Hawthorne, both yeah. masters of their craft. And and uh, ju just a couple, just a couple of the roles that he had at round about the same time as uh, Black Cauldron. He was uh, Captain Campion, however you pronounce it. In yeah, I think I think that's pretty. Right. I think yeah. that's right. In in Watership Down, he was also Doctor Boycott in The Plague Dogs, both done both based off the um, uh, Richard Harris. I think it is Richard Harris books. I think so that's I, right. Yeah, I think it's Richard Harris. I might be wrong on that one. Mm. Richard Adams, that's who it is. Yeah. Ah, but the so, two roles he's best known for are um, Sir Humphrey Appleby in Yes Minister and its sequel series Yes Prime Minister, and King ah. George the and King George the Third in the in Madness, Madness of, of King George, George, which is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, and uh, oh, turns out the Black Cauldron wouldn't be the only Disney film he would be involved in, because he was Professor Porter in Tarzan way all the way in 1999. Mm -hmm. And don't worry, I'll get to the Renaissance films soon. I'm I'm planning on cover. I'm planning on spending just the whole summer covering the Renaissance films. That's why I'm getting all these episodes recorded he, as as quickly as possible, so I can get them recorded, edited, and uploaded in order of when the films are released. And then I've got the whole summer to focus on just the Renaissance films before I start college at the end of August. He also um, quite famously um, hated doing the movie Demolition Man with Sylvester Stallone and Wesley Snipes. Oh, that one. Phoenix! <laughs> oh, such a fun movie. Yeah, it's, it's... And yet, and yet somehow that, and yet somehow that the Demolition Man still has a lot of relevancy today. Yeah, and yet we... We still might never know the true answer of what you do with the three shells. Oh yeah, and the, yeah. The nostalgia critic made a massive thing about that when he actually covered the, that film for, for for that episode of his. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think I think show. Um, I think they did. Um, somebody asked the uh, director or the writer, like, um, I don't know if it was during an interview or something, but somebody asked them, and they finally uh, gave an answer. You can. Um, uh, Look it up, but the answer is uh, just as strange as you think it would be. Yeah, but back to the Black Cauldron. Um, the the um, along we Tyron and uh, Fluda, they Fluda Flam. Yes, uh, they 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 try and they manage to uh, they manage to escape thanks to the help of the King's sword, which uh, Tyron manages to find. Um, he ends up, um, he finds the sword, stumbles across one of uh, the Horn King's uh, henchmen uh, on the verge of being uh, chopped to pieces by the axe. And then, wow! The, the, wow does, um, how much power does that sword have? All the power. He-Man power. 
<laughs> yeah. The, the only thing missing for it, to, the only thing missing is by the power of Grey Skull. That's the only <laughs> thing that was missing. <laughs> yeah, I say, I say He Man was all be... around about the same time anyway. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if um, the Horned King is like the brother of Skeletor or something. <laughs> Ooh, now, that would be a fun theory to put together. I might have to write a fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like because because uh, my my guest for the Sleeping Beauty episode, they actually wrote a fan fiction <laughs> on how Maleficent and the Horned King are related in some capacity. Cool. And, and and I was I was just sitting I was just sitting here just in awe of listening to this and was, and I'm just and once 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 she had explained everything uh, w- once she had explained the whole theory and I was my my response was something along the lines of this is why I love Disney fan theories <laughs> yeah but uh, and yeah. yeah thinking of the the sword how um, you know it has. Uh, so much power and I think that might have been another thing that they had to tone down in the edit because he just um chops up the axe with the sword but I think maybe in um an early edit or something I think he might have actually gone all the way and uh stabby stabby pleasant yeah but um see but, but at the end of the day see seeing the power that showcased from that sword uh mm. we're just like or just like okay, that that's a game changer. Yeah, it's Massive like glowing, brilliantly glowing and shimmering, and it's yeah, it, it's so cool. Yeah, I say just the music and the I say the music at that point, and of course the the sound design. You, you see that the the metallic chime, if you will. Yeah, just absolutely incredible. Uh, but but back to flute of flam for a moment uh let's say okay, i am convinced that when, when he's talking and then you see the strings snap on his on his little harp i am convinced that the strings were acting like pinocchio's nose yeah i i think that was the idea like whenever he's uh exaggerating his importance or saying i am i'll have you know i'm the greatest bard in all the land <laughs> yep but uh yeah. although i did um i did uh hear somewhere that in the original books which i've um never read but i i intend to someday in the book um fluter flam was originally uh a king of some uh dull little land in in um, a distant part of pradane but so little happens there that sometimes he'll just leave his kingdom and go out into the world and be a bard. But apparently he says, oh, my kingdom's getting on just fine without me. And then, boing! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh... they, they don't um, have a reference to that in the movie, but that's a fun little bit of backstory. Yeah. yeah. So, they met... so, yeah. Um, the, the trio managed to escape from... Um... The three managed to escape from uh, the castle, and they um, they uh, they end they end up in this they end up in like uh, a they end up in a forest area, and oh um, and then oh boy, help! Murder! <laughs> Hurry! Oh, ha, ha, just lucky day. <laughs> oh boy. Yep, they encounter Gurgi again. <laughs> Do you have to like prepare yourself whenever you're talking about Gurgi? Like I said, I said, like the the only like major criticism is the, is mainly the sound of his voice. That's like the only like major criticism I have. Yeah. But, but but like but like I said, um, I say his voice actor uh, did really well with what he was given at the end of the day. Yes, exactly. So yeah, um, so they end up. Um, I say so. Gurgi ends up in this. Um, he, he uh, this like like uh, pond or whatever. He ends up yeah in this. He ends up being caught in this whirlpool. And then everyone else is dragged in with them. 
and uh, they end up in this underground kingdom of the fair folk. <laughs> yeah. So then, so, so the only, so the only, re, uh, so the only, um, the only, the only major voice cast member for uh, the Fair Folk is uh, John Biner, who voices um, uh, Dolly or Dolly, however you pronounce it. Um, I think it's Dolly. Yeah, yeah, Dolly. Yeah, we'll go with Dolly. Uh, yeah. Oh, actually, no, actually, there's two. Actually, uh, they've got uh, Arthur. You've got Arthur Mallet, who is King. How in the world do you pronounce that? E I D I double L E G. I think they said it was Idolag. We'll go with Idolag. Yeah. Again, I, I, I think I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah. That's it. If we've pronounced it wrong, let us know in the comments, folks. Um, was it uh, King Idolag? Um, they uh, they managed to reunite Henwin with uh, Tyrant, and you, you can just see the joy on Henwin's face at this point. I mean, she's she's happy to she's happy to be back with Tyrant. Um, yeah. For a brief moment, though, because, um, because, uh, because, because our companions have to head to the, uh, they have to head to uh, Morva, because that is where the cauldron is actually located. But they have assured Taran, especially, that they will be able to get. Uh, Henwin home, which they managed to do. So when they he- so when they get to Morva, which has a very as I um, uh, Dolly's decided to tag along as well for the time being. Uh, I've, I say f- from my perspective, from my perspective, he is the eighties version of Grumpy from Snow White, if you will. Basically, yeah, uh, yeah. When they head to Morva, which has a uh, I, like, I mean, just like the, the the swamp in that particular area, especially, it does have a very striking resemblance. To, I mean, just that whole setting for that scene, a very striking resemblance to the swamp of sadness from the Never Ending Story. Yeah. See, see, you can definitely tell they went for a lot of. You, you can definitely tell they were influenced by other like fantasy related uh, media. Hmm. So they get to Morva, they get to the um they get to the cottage where the three witches are. Um it's Ordu, Orgoch, and Orwen. Uh Orwen ends up being the one that ends up falling in love with uh, Fluda, effectively love at first sight here, folks. But uh yeah. before we in, before we get to see the those three witches on screen, yeah, there's a lot of frogs. Yeah, the yeah the witches do like to turn people into frogs for some mm. bizarre reason. You know, all all this talk of uh, three witches and a cauldron. I'm I'm getting serious Macbeth flashbacks here. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> oh boy, but yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, they um they make they make a trade where they where Tyrant trades his sword in to get the cauldron. Uh, we, was it, Tyrant did... Was it, it was reluctant. Tyrant was reluctant to give up the sword, but he, he, agrees, to the, he agrees to the trade. They have the cauldron, and just, just the way the cauldron just comes up through... Yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah. But... Um, Again, that that dramatic music, of bum, bum, bum. the yeah. way it way it builds and builds, it 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 gets you. Yeah, and it's I say it's it's not the first time I've thrown this term about when it comes to describing characters, but I will say this: those witches are irredeemable. It's not mm. very often I use that term, but I used it for Lady Tremaine. I used yep. it for. Who else have I used it for? Corella Deville. Um, you can add you can add the uh, uh, the evil queen from Snow White to that mix as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, we've got 
effectively six characters on the irredeemable list right now, from, just just from Disney. I would say because of how um, inhuman he is, I'd add the Horned King onto that as well. That's it's like, I would be tempted to make him. I would I would be tempted to have him as an irredeemable character, but. To, for it to be an irredeemable character is going to be a character that you like you really hate and there's nothing you like about them oh right 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 okay i see what you mean i say, I say, I say that, that, that that's my criteria for irredeemable um anyway i mean i mean chick hicks from the first cars film perfect example of that oh cannot stand the guy <laughs> see i wouldn't necessarily um describe that as irredeemable by the definition of the word but i i do i do get where you're coming from <laughs> yeah but, uh, but it, it's mainly what it's mainly what chick does at the end of that final race that just yeah. pushes him fully into the irredeemable area yeah see i think of an irredeemable villain as somebody who you know d- like is doing all kinds of horrible things but just doesn't care is in it for themselves 100 percent. like will not you know have any pity have no care for anybody apart from their own selfish interests through and through and there's nothing that can persuade them otherwise yeah but uh but once but once that trade is made um mm. they've they've st- uh the three witches the three witches um, like give them split explicit instructions on on how the uh, the power from the cauldron can be stopped. Uh, somebody needs to go into the cauldron of their own free will, at the expense of them not coming back alive. Hmm. So yeah. Um, so yeah, Gurg is just like, yes, I'll go in until they until they explain the fact that uh, yeah, once They'll you go never in, come you back ain't- alive. He's just like, nope. <laughs> yeah. But um, but after all that, the henchmen surround so they surround um they surround the group. Uh they're back in the dungeon and uh, the cauldron's there, and then we just wait for the horned king to arrive. And such <sighs> a creepy shot where you see his shadow like in on the on the wall in the doorway as he's just coming forward oh so yeah. good <laughs> yeah which which is going to tie into uh, what which is going to tie into my uh, obligatory reference to my fun notes if you will oh yeah <laughs> bear with me oh, damn it. i hate when you go to swallow something and it goes down the wrong way oh yeah <clears throat> Nothing worse. <laughs> but I will power through as I often do. Yes, yeah. we'll soldier on. Yep. I say that that that's that's pretty much all I've really been in. That's pretty much all I've been able to do throughout uh, the last year and a bit, just just soldiering on. Yeah. Uh but yeah, the um let's say he he has he has he starts his ritual of Resurrecting the cult, creating yeah, the cauldron born I, army. Yeah, I love when he comes into the room as well. When he like sees the three of them there and he just cuts them all down with his words, saying, A pig boy, a scullery maid, and a and broken a minstrel. down minstrel. Oh. Perhaps it may interest you to see what fate has in store for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so creepy. But but I say but, but it's it's just it's just the line he says when he creates this cauldron born army. Arise, my messengers of death! Our time, our time has, has arrived. arrived. Seriously, and again, Disney. And again, you see the red eyes, and you're like, "Yes, th- it is." <laughs> Is there anything even human left in him? If he, wa- assuming he was human at some point, or is he just a demon? Is he just a a, a lich? I think that's how it's pronounced. Like <clears throat> that that kind of ah uh, yeah. Oh, whatever he is, yeah. <clears throat> nasty. Yeah. Whatever the case, Disney. Seriously, and this is this is the this is the fun note I'm bringing up here. Seriously, Disney. How much more nightmare fuel do you want to give us? <laughs> 
Because I think I think just just the visual, it's just just the blackness of the cauldron and the horned king, and you just see this huge just pillar of flame. I can I can only assume, and then you yeah. just have this you have this like skeleton this skull in, the, in like, this pillar that melts back into the fire and it's oh so... and then you just and then you just see oh my word and it's and then and then this henchmen are just like okay what's gonna happen here and then boom cauldron born army and you're just like what the skeletons just like crawling up out of the slime Made even better if when they're doing that, you you say skeleton warriors da 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 da. <laughs> I was I was actually half tempted to go spooky scary skeletons, but I think that <laughs> I think that particular song's a little bit too cheery for this one. So yeah, the Agreed. skeleton skeletons warriors one that definitely works better for this one. Yeah. Can somebody can somebody, somebody actually edit that? Uh, can somebody yeah. actually edit that scene with that music together, please? <laughs> and I mentioned um, certain deleted scenes. There's one that has yes. made online, which is rather uh, infamous. If I remember correctly, one of these um, skeletons grabs um, one of the henchmen. I believe the one who poked his spear into the slime to see what happens. And the guy starts like, essentially melting like rotting away until he himself is now one of the cauldron born and we've never seen a fully animated version of this scene as far as i know just like still frames but even those are like oh that is that's <laughs> not pleasant this, this was this is disney like <laughs> <laughs> yeah you'd be fit yeah you know, the initial reaction would be like this is not a disney film yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I will say this: if that scene was left in this film, that would have given it a PG thirteen rating right out the gate. Yeah, if if not before, then nightmares one hundred percent guaranteed after that. Yep. <laughs> it it does make me wonder of what um, the reaction would be to a darker cut of this if any of those like surviving bits of animation were restored. That is assuming any do survive other than just that deleted scene with, as I say, the still frames, you know, maybe some of the original scenes are hidden in a Disney vault somewhere. Yeah. Well, what actually happened was with the test screening that they had for this film, because mm. uh, it was originally going to be released around about Christmas, 1984. <laughs> Yeah. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Here's a horror film for you! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's just say the test screening did not go well. Mm. And the Disney Studio chairman at the time, Jeffrey Katzenberg, explicitly ordered that certain scenes be cut uh, because of this, because it was up... Um, this this is this is the bit here. This is the bit in particular that we're actually at, which is pretty convenient. After the <laughs> film, particularly the climactic Cauldron Born sequence, proved to be too intense and disturbing for the majority of the children in the audience, in brackets, most of whom ran out of the theater in terror before it was even finished. They ran out screaming in terror before the film was finished. <laughs> Which makes you wonder, what, considering the film itself is still pretty intense. So what on earth was the original one like? I am, dr I am actually dreading the prospect of actually finding this out. I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, you're curious. I'm flipping terrified. <laughs> Talk about two polar opposites. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it, but yeah, um, yeah. Cauldron Born Army doesn't exactly last very long though, because um, because uh, the trio, Tarin, Fluda, and Elonwi, they managed to get out of their um, captivity, and Tarin decides he's the one that's going to jump into the cauldron, but uh, Gurgi. Wow, ends up taking Tyron's place. 
and and th- that that line before he jumps into the cauldron wow it's actually it's actually pretty powerful Tarin yeah. has many friends Gurgi has no friends and he's just like yeah and you're just thinking I yeah I actually feel sorry for I actually feel sorry for Gurgi at this point yeah like I mean sure he's been kind of annoying but still like you don't want to see him sacrificed because of it the, the, I mean I mean in the grand scheme of things the way he was treated throughout this film yeah like but, you think oh poor little guy yeah but Gurgi. he does ju- he, he no. jumps in don't and jump. you just you Wait. see this like, just no! these explosions no! and Tara's just like oh. but that works to effectively no. kill the cauldron board army and it's not and it's uh, not the first time it's happened and it won't be the last uh yeah the horned king blames creeper for this <laughs> this, this, and, this and i love the better not be your fault and i love the line when when creeper says perhaps it needs another body yes yours, yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh yeah but uh, here's the thing just when we thought we didn't have enough nightmare fuel, uh, yeah, it's uh, I say he's be- I say, uh, Horned King begging the Cauldron Born to like just like get, get up. up, come alive. Yeah, maybe, 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 maybe they're just uh, maybe they're just asleep and they do something. My life depends on it. And, and, then- and then one of then one of the most intense lines ever heard in a Disney movie. Get up, you fools! Kill! Full glowing red eyes at this point! Oh! Yeah, just when we thought we didn't have enough nightmare fuel. Nope, here's some more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is I would definitely not... All I can say is I would definitely not recommend showing this to younger children, especially before bed. <laughs> oh, no. Un- no. Un- unless you want to be up all night trying to calm them down. If you think for some reason that nightmares are good for your kids, then sure, this will do it. Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. Just have fun not being able to sleep for the night and end up being tired for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it turns out... Uh, it turns out it's actually Tarin that ends up uh, getting the blame. And the Horn King says that uh, Tarin has interviewed for the last time. And... It's always such like, oh, it's always good hearing a villain saying you've done X for the last time. You have failed me for the last time. You've interfered for the last time, blah, blah, blah. It's just one of those cliched villain lines that always just hits. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, Tarin manages to escape the grasp of the Horned King, uh, holding on to the, those, one of those large door knockers on the, one of the pillars. Mm. And uh, you, just, you just see... And, and all you hear in the music at this point, you just hear the, you just hear the strings going... Just... Just that, in, just the intensity of that moment. You just the Horned King just going closer no! and closer to the cult. You will not, not have me. My power cannot die. My and then the curse. You. And curse oh you. my word! Yeah, oh. just full destruction of the Horned yep. King. The skin being ripped from his bones as he's being sucked into the cult. Again, Disney. Yeah. Chill, chill, Disney. Yeah, calm down. You, you've got, you've got plenty of time to. You've got plenty of. You got, you've got plenty of years to go before you can go into that regular, go into full dark territory on a regular basis, especially when. Yeah. Especially, especially with, especially with some Disney fans that I know that love the darker side of things from Disney. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, case in point, me. (laughs) Need we say more beyond that? (laughs) But yeah, uh, Horned King's destroyed, and uh, Creeper is loving the fact that uh, the Horned King's gone. And then (gasps) the castle is, uh, it starts to get destroyed here, just starts to fall apart, sinking into the water. And I did spot a somewhat large continuity error here. 
when you've got uh, when you've got our trio in in a boat escaping the castle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got the shot of uh, Taran being able to push the gates open, but then in the very next shot, they're closed again. <laughs> and it's very rare that I point out these major continuity errors. And I actually and I actually put continuity error in my notes in all caps at this point. <laughs> I guess you needed something to distract you from the horrors that you've just seen. Uh, yeah, but uh, but yeah, the trio managed to escape, and then you and then you see these three witches um, that we saw earlier. Um, they do this trade. Um, Tarrant gets Gurgi's body back in exchange for giving the witches the cauldron back, and so it's just. And you just see Gurgi's lifeless body there, and you just um I say some, something I did something I did notice when when watching this film earlier this week, folks. Uh, I say it's not the first time it's happened. Um I say, I say, I think, yeah, yeah, it's not it's not the first time it's happened. That it this would this, this would actually be the start of like somewhat of a trend at this particular point in Disney's um uh, in yeah, I know the um, one you mean. As far as Disney, Disney's animated films are concerned, where this this yeah. era of Disney, maybe. Uh, yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. This right. uh, the, a trend in this starting from uh, Black Cauldron on a regular basis, where you think that one of the character, where well, you think that one of the um, uh, heroic characters, like Gurgi in this case, has uh, has died, um, but ends up. Ends up being being okay. Ends up being end. okay. Yeah, I say it's. I say it's not the. It's. I say it's not the first time we've seen it happen. We because we because we thought Snow White had died at the end of Snow White because of the poisoned apple. But then, but then the true love's kiss thing, happy ending. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really class Aurora because that was um, that was the the spindle the spinning wheel. She she was in yeah. a deep sleep at that point, so that one doesn't count. Uh. Blue in the Jungle Book. I just realized I forgot about them. Uh, Blue in the yeah. Jungle Book. Yes. Just that huge, just that huge scratch from Shere Khan just spins around and then boom. I saw um, a YouTube edit of that scene a while ago where. Oh, the classic YouTube poops. Oh, no, no. This wasn't um, a YouTube poop. This was just, just an edit okay. where um, Bagheera is giving his speech, like uh, giving his tribute to. Um, Baloo and Mm -hmm. instead of the shots where you see Baloo's eyes opening we see shots of other Disney characters in tears as someone has died and then once Bagheera's speech is finished the the video fades to black so in this video (laughs) Baloo actually died! Wow! (laughs) Oh dear yeah but um, but like I say it's it's not the first time we've seen uh, one of the um, one of the good guys supposedly dead and then Ending up being okay because let's say Snow White. Uh, oh, and Pinocchio as well. While we're at it, uh, Pinocchio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As I, as I, as I that that was. I say the ending for that film in itself. That that was that was pretty intense. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, uh, you had that. Uh, yeah, Blue in the Jungle Book, Black Cauldron here, and uh, just a quick heads up. Practically the same case here with uh, Basil, the Great Mouse Detective. But of course, Basil's like the protagonist of the film. Yeah, so but, it hits a bit. Yeah, yeah, but, but it, it's still effectively the same trend. One of the good guys supposedly dead, but turns turns out they're okay in the end. Yes. Yeah. Let's say, let's say, let's say this would actually start the trend of this happening on a regular basis throughout um, throughout this mm-hmm. era and even into the Renaissance films as well. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah. Um, but yeah, and then and then Taran and Enlon we end up uh, sharing a kiss together, and I'm just like, oh, how cute! Um, they, <laughs> they go they go home, and then and then like uh, the the last like couple of was like, um, uh, cast there with me, yeah, uh, Do- Dolly agreeing with um, uh, Dolben, saying that uh, yeah, Taran, you've you've done well, my boy, and then that's the end of the film, and. It's the first, this is the first time since Alice in Wonderland that we actually have closing credits at the end of the film. Mm. 
It's, it's a thing that we've waited 34 years to actually see credits on a regular basis at the end of each film. But yeah, that's it. That's the end of The Black Cauldron. I mean, wow. <laughs> it, call- it was a ride. That would be a massive understatement. Uh, say, to call it <laughs> say, another understatement there, to call it intense, yeah. But, but say, but taking all taking all of that into account, mm. it is still a it is still a great film. I say it is it is all it is up there as one of the most underrated Disney yeah. films, without a doubt. It's a it's a great um, dark fantasy movie, warts and all. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it, it, it it is it does have its problems, but yeah, like it it but it's still a great journey. Definitely, yeah. So uh, that being said, uh, the scores now. Um, mm. So uh, the story I gave the story I gave a ten. I say it's, it's like I say it's it, it's, I say it's, it's very rare very rare that I'm able to like. Very well that I'm actually able to uh, fault something if I, if I give it a ten. Okay? And, and this is another one of those examples. I say the story they did really well with uh, the source material. And the thing you, the thing that you brought up, Alan, regarding um, uh, Aaron, um, yes, so, uh, him well, supposedly had... being in the like the, the evil spirits in that black cauldron itself. And I, th- and I yeah. thought, yeah, that does actually make sense. Yeah, because they said um, one of the challenges with this movie was essentially condensing five books into one story yeah and that's not always going to be easy with some things but yeah in this but, case i think they pulled it off yeah but say, uh, in, in the end they actually ab- adapted just two of the books like fully yes like, uh, the book of yes. three and the black cauldron itself so yeah as yes. a story, story i gave a 10 on that one um characters i get i say characters i gave a nine we all know. I uh, say uh, we all know why. I've already explained my reasons why. Ma- main, mainly, mainly from mainly from Gergi's point of view, but that's really a, that's really about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like uh, other than that, you know, you've got um, uh, a main character who goes through a bit of you know a, a selfish and stubborn phase, but then learns about the the greater good and the importance mm-hmm. of the people you have around you and sacrifice and all that. You've got. Um, a capable heroine you've got uh, mm-hmm. good you've got some good comedy relief in the form yeah. of flu of flam and of course you have one of the greatest disney villains ever yeah a- absolutely i mean i say i say Haunt king definitely up there as one of the best disney villains of all time i say it's, yep. it's just it's just a big shame that this film doesn't often get talked about as one of the best films that they've made mm. it's, and especially and I, I, it's, I do kind yeah. of understand why but I think it does deserve some recognition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and I'll I'll cover that when I get to the legacy section of the scores. Yeah, uh, I say visuals visuals. I gave a nine, uh, but the thing with that is, I mean, don't get me wrong. Visual visually, it's a fantastic. It does yeah, look it's, fantastic. It's stunning. It, yeah, it's the first film to use uh, CG. It's the first animated Disney film to use CG in the animation process, but. I just, I just felt that, um, I just felt that some of the, some of the visuals were a bit. I, I just, I said, just, I'm, 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 tr- I'm trying to take, I'm trying to take um, uh, kids into the equation with this. I just feel that some of the visuals would be too intense a for too a younger much. audience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. F- fair enough. But I say, but, but I say, but apart, I say, I say, if it wasn't for that, the visuals would be a ten, no question. Yeah. If it wasn't, um, if it was, it if it had been allowed to be darker, and they had and they had made it um, PG thirteen, and they yeah. said no kids allowed, you know, if they'd yeah. gone all out with that angle, that's mainly, fine. Mainly for, but, mainly for, for a more young adult audience. Yes, but there I do go. understand from a business sense why they didn't. Yeah, I say, I say it, it's understandable, but I say. You'll say, if they had aimed it more for a PG-13 audience, then yes, I'd have been given the visuals a 10 without a doubt. I mean, I might have even pushed it to an 11. That's how good these wonder, visuals are. I do have to wonder, though, if it might have been more of a hit, if it had been 
all out PG-13. Something tells me no, but there's a, <laughs> there, there is the possibility. I don't know. That's just uh, a what if. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's all they'll ever be. They'll, they'll forever be what ifs. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. Um, so, soundtrack. That, that's a 10. That's, that goes, that goes without question. Oh, yeah. uh, so there was there was actually two there was actually two uh, versions of the soundtrack. There's there's one version of the soundtrack that's just over half an hour long, and then you've got um, one that includes includes more of the film score, um, which is which is effectively the length of the film oh. uh, that was released on April third, twenty twelve. Check that out. Yeah. I say, I say, I say, hopefully, hopefully we can try and find these somewhere because the, I say these are probably going to be, I say, I say, I mean, just having a copy of this soundtrack in some form is definitely, it's definitely going to be a collector's item without a doubt. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, well, the legacy of this film. This is this is one I was somewhat apprehensive to do as far as the score was concerned. Yeah, yeah, because. I mean, just for just for a bit of context to take the score into account uh, to get a bit more context as far as the score is concerned, it had a budget of forty four million dollars and it only made just over twenty one million. Mm. So just be, just just under half its budget and and it got mixed reviews from critics as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and actually, I'm going to see what the reception <clears throat> was. Oh no, that's just for the no, that's for the soundtrack. Um, critical reception for the film. There it is. That's what we're after. Oh my, fifty-five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm, fifty-nine, I, fifty-nine on Metacritic. Oh boy, yeah, fifty-nine. I, I, that one I can swallow a bit more than the fifty-five. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but I'm a bit iffy on um, Rotten Tomatoes at the best of times. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Uh... Although one thing, one thing I do uh, love about Rotten Tomatoes, one um, factoid I'll always remember about Rotten Tomatoes. Have you ever heard? Um, you you might have heard this actually. Uh, the movie The Master of Disguise, one of the worst movies of all time, has a one percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and apparent, and and apparently their statistics have a one percent margin of error. So technically, it has either. So technically, it should have a zero percent. Technically, <laughs> yeah. And I've seen the movie, and yeah, that that sounds about right. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, despite that, uh, because the thing is. Because uh, the thing, uh, let's see, uh, critics voicing disapproval of its dark na nature and disjointed writing, but they did praise the animation soundtrack and voice acting. Yeah. I say $44 million. At the time, it was the most expensive animated film at the time. Um, didn't it start production in uh, 1980 and then came out in 1985? Uh, they they acquired the rights to the books in 1973, and the film did begin production in 1980. Right, but uh, dis uh, but as a result of its commercial failure, it didn't actually get a it didn't actually get a home video release until 1997 in the UK and 1998 uh, stateside. But despite that, this film does have a cult following. And that's one of the reasons why I said this is uh, a cult classic towards the beginning of this episode. Yeah. But, um, but, for, the fact that, but for the fact that it was uh, effectively a box office bomb and the fact that it put uh, the entire animation uh, sector of Disney in jeopardy, mm. um. I, I gave the legacy of this film an eight. Now, yeah, now, yeah. now, now, don't get me wrong. I still don't get me wrong. That's still a very reasonable score for such an intense film. Because yeah, and, and that, that's fair. Yeah, 
It's like because there have been there have been of there have been so the Black Cauldron has been um, referenced elsewhere, be it in mm. be it in theme parks and in their video games as well. I think mm-hmm. there's 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 costumed versions of the characters that make occasional that have made occasional appearances at, at all the various uh, Disney parks. You've got the um, you've got uh, in 1986 the Lancers Inn. Which is in uh, Walt Disney World, which I would assume is the one in Florida. Yes, it is. It was mm-hmm. renamed Gurgi's Munchies and Crunchies, making reference to <laughs> Gurgi's line Munchies and Crunchies in here somewhere. Um, it eventually closed in 1993 and it was remodeled uh, to be Lumiere's Kitchen from Beauty and the Beast, the Village Fry Shop. I'm trying to remember what that what that one's from, uh, and the Friar's Nook, which I would assume is Friar Tuck from Robin Hood, I would imagine it was. I might be wrong on that one. Um, that one, yeah. Yeah. I was like, so they've, um, they've made, I say the characters have made appearances at the uh, the Disney parks, most most notably in the um, in the Fantasyland, which is one of the themed lands at all the Magic Kingdom uh, parks at the uh, at the Walt Disney World. Uh, there's also, there was also a video game released. Um, it's by Al Lowe, um, made by Sierra Online, released in 1986. It was made shortly after the first King's Quest game. Um, what platform was it on? It was uh, MS DOS, uh, Amiga, Apple II. It was it was mainly it was mainly the P, it was mainly PC platforms. It also had an NES port uh, as well. Mm. So so it does. So it does have it does have a lot going for it in on the um, in in the legacy department, but uh, overall the score uh, is of is f- I would definitely say a very respectable ninety two percent, which has it tied with Cinderella for sixth place. Fair so enough. I say ninety two percent. That's still a very respectable score, folks. Yeah, not not to be sneezed at. Yeah. But anyway, that does it for this episode of the uh, Kingdom of Isolation. Alan, once again, thanks very much for joining me on board uh, for this episode. And I'm very much fun as always. To, yeah, definitely looking forward to having you on board for doing uh, Basil, the great mouse detective for our next episode. But until yes. then, if you enjoyed this episode, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be Dream Chasers like us, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the Dream Chasers notification squad so you don't miss anything that we do on do this it. channel. <laughs> yeah, otherwise the Horned King is going to be haunting our nightmares tonight if we don't do the subscribe and all that. But yeah. Yes. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, unto, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I say we're gonna do we're gonna do Basil the Great Mouth Detective um, for the uh, for the next episode. But until then, we will see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation.